Southgate. My name's Tannis, and for those of you who are new here, uh, do us a favor, let us know where you're watching from in the comments, or if you're even more adventurous, send us an email at hello at southgatechurch.com. Now today, we are getting ready to talk all about uh, the environment, growing things, caring for God's creation, and how to do that as a follower of Jesus. That's better. Would you share with us what you like to grow in the comments? Uh, if you're a farmer, if you have uh, people that you locally love to source out environmentally friendly gear, let us know, we'd love to hear about that. Parents, we have some specially designed kids content for you at our Kidville YouTube channel. Check that out at the link below. We wanna help you grow throughout the week, so check out our social channels and uh, join in the conversation and the community. Each week, many of you partner with us to help others grow by giving financially. The ways are on the screen if you'd like to do that, and this week, if you're not able to, um, that's okay. You can still partner with us by sharing this post. Invite others um, to grow and to experience some life around them. Now, before we get started, let's just take a moment to pray. Thank you, God, for your creation and that you've entrusted us to care for it and to be good stewards of it. Help us to learn some new uh, ways to do that and to do that in a way that honors you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, so we have been at our house uh, getting ready for our garden, all right? And so I am not a huge gardener, but we have been kind of getting the seedlings ready and, and kind of looking after those, and uh, we kind of marked out our, our garden for the summer. We thought it'd be a great opportunity, and I think there's really important truths that we can learn in our spiritual lives from gardening and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the fruit and the vegetables that, uh, that those bear, but but it's interesting, right? Because the earth was, was given to, to leverage and to use it and to care for it. But oftentimes, we see images kind of like these. And so, so let's check out some of these. I mean, we see waterways that are absolutely polluted. And maybe in Canada, it's not as bad as some other places in the world. But I mean, we see images like this, and they're undeniable. Or the smog that is over cities of the world, major cities, especially when it's, when it's hot. And during this pandemic, they're saying that the, the pollution has kind of dropped significantly because there's not as many cars on the road or factories uh, kind of under production. And so uh, let's jump to this next one. I mean, big trash heaps. And if you're, even if you're driving down the 416 to Ottawa, there's a huge dump, right? And we see these mound, huge gigantic mounds of, of trash uh, outside of every major city where these dumps uh, lay full of plastic and, and garbage. And, uh, and so we have, I mean, uh, let's jump to this next one here. I mean, beaches. If you've ever been to a beach, no doubt you've found glass on that beach from bottles that have kind of floated up, or, or, uh, or if you're at the ocean, you can find things that kind of wash up on shore, and, and at public beaches, they've got to clean them like every day to, to pick up the trash that people leave uh, behind, or the animals that get caught up with in, in pollution and garbage that are thrown into the sea. And, and I know that there are different uh, different kind of thoughts, patterns, and ideas and ideals about climate change and, and environmental policy. And I don't know what you believe or, or where you stand in some of that. And, and the cause of pollution uh, may differ uh, d depending on, on you know, our stance on things. But the pictures that we just saw, I mean, those are undeniable pictures. The, th these things actually happen. You, you can't argue with, with what is presented in that, all right? And so we see pollution as a major problem. We know that God has given us this earth. And, uh, and, and c does environmentalism and Christianity, are they, are, 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 can they come together or are they two separate entities? And, and we as the church or believers who follow Jesus, do we have a role to play in environmentalism. Is it, our, is it our role to play there? 
And so let's see what the Word of God has to say about this. We're just going to kind of turn to Scripture, see what Scripture has to say. I mean, during this global pandemic and, and uh, understanding this earth that has been given to us, how do we leverage that in the midst of this? And so let, let's just go right to the beginning, all right? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it reads like this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right, God created everything. And basically what this is saying is that every single thing in the world, every single thing that we see, that we interact with, it, it all comes from God. He created the heavens and the earth. He still owns it. He just asks us to take care of it, all right? Or we jump to this one in Psalm 24, verse 1. It reads like this. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, all right? And so everything belongs to God. Everything is his He's given us the ability to kind of oversee it and to manage it, but he, 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 he says everything in it is his. And so the oceans and the mountains and the lakes and the, the rivers and, and, and the forests, I mean, it all belongs to him. Everything in this world is God's, and we're supposed to take care of it. And so if we go back to the beginning in the book of Genesis, he, he does highlight there's just four quick things that we really ought to consider when we look at his creation and what he has given us and, and how we should manage it. And the first one, the first thing he tells us to do right back in the book of Genesis, right at the beginning, is to subdue it, all right? To subdue it. And, uh, and I'm just turning your attention to Genesis 1.28. It reads like this. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it, all right? Subdue it. What, what, what does this mean? What, what, is, what does subduing mean? And, uh, and so in our yard, we have about two acres of property, and we have a whole bunch of trees in our property. And, um, and those trees, I mean, when, when the snow melts, basically every spring, as soon as that snow melts, we got to pick up sticks. I mean, there's, pick, there's sticks all over our yard. We got to pick them all up and, uh, and carry them. We have them put them on a pile and normally we burn them up. And, uh, and, and, or, or if there's a huge windstorm, we have to pick up sticks from, that drop from those trees. Or every year we got to prune some of those branches. We, we have to mow the lawn. We have to look after this thing because if you don't do that, it gets unruly, all right? It just, it just kind of grows up into chaos or craziness. And you think about vines that kind of grow up the wall of a building or on a fence and it just kind of takes over. And I think about like those apocalyptic movies and they, they pan in on New York City and there's like, there's like, like horses running through downtown or, or, or there's vines and trees kind of growing up and it's overgrown. This subduing it means to kind of prune back, to, 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 to groom it, to, to, to look after it, right? To, to take that unruly stuff and lop it off and clear the path, all right? So subdue it. That's an instruction for us as we look at creation and the environment. The second thing we find in Genesis is to rule over it. And I'll point your attention to Genesis one twenty six. It reads like this. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air over the livestock and over all the earth itself and every creature that crawls upon it. So to rule over it, rule over it. And the image that I get when ruling over something is kind of, is kind of how I parent, all right? Now, I don't, I don't parent, I don't mean like ruling over my kids as like a king in a throne with a scepter. That's not what I mean. But I mean that I probably have more knowledge than my kids have, and I'm going to rule over them. I'm going to kind of guide the way to help them and to grow them so that they will understand some of the knowledge and the experiences that I've had. I can pass it down to them, right? And so to rule over it, this is kind of, this is kind of understanding to, as, 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 a, as, as a shepherd kind of thing, but not, not in an abusive type of way. This is not just coming down upon it. This is not abusing the land or abusing animals or abusing creation. This is just kind of an overseeing capacity to rule over it. And so that's the second one. The third one is to work it, and it's from Genesis 3, 23. And it reads like this. Therefore the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And so to work the ground. So to work the environment, to, to leverage that, he's given us the things that we need 
to leverage it and to use it to look after ourselves, right, in the creation. And so to work it, if you have a garden, you're going to grow stuff in that garden. So this year, I think I'm planting some corn. I got some, some cucumbers. I have some peppers. I, I, have, I have a bunch of different things that I'm growing in that garden. But in order to grow that garden, I had to till that garden, right? I had to till it. I have to fertilize it and I have to get that ground ready. I'm going to have to weed it time and time again. I'm going to have to water it and, uh, and I'm going to have to work it in order for that land to bear fruit, in order for that garden to bear fruit. And so work it is a description. And then finally, keep it is the last one uh, that we find in Genesis. And I'll point your attention to Genesis 2.15. It says this, Then the Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. All right? And what I mean by this is uh, is this sense of keeping it safe. And so some of you, you have gardens and you have those raised garden beds, right? You've made those garden boxes. And maybe you, in all four corners, you have like a spike that comes up and you've put chicken wire around it. Or maybe you've put some type of wiring on the top or netting on the top to keep the birds out or to keep the chipmunks or the squirrels or the rabbits or whatever. And you keep them out because you're protecting the crop. You're protecting what you are doing there in working that soil or working it. And so you want to keep it. You want to protect it. And so those are the four key instructions that God gives creation, gives us to manage his creation in the book of Genesis. Now, we're going to t- I'm going to have an interview with an expert here, and I'd like to uh, introduce you to Brian, and uh, we'll jump into this interview and see what he has to say about environmentalism and, uh, and, and kind of leveraging these four truths from the book, book of Genesis. Check it out. All right, and so uh, thanks for joining me. This is a little uh, different today. Um, I, in search for good internet, I'm actually in my car parked outside of someone else's house, uh, and I am um, not stealing. I'm borrowing their internet uh, to get a good connection here. So we'll see how this goes in our recording today. So why don't you introduce yourself? All right. So my name is Brian Reiki. My wife, Jenny, and I have been going to Southgate since the fall of 2014. We have two children. Asley is about four years old, or almost four years old, and Ezra is around 15 months. I grew up in farming, and since marrying Jenny seven years ago, I've been working in horticulture, growing fruits and vegetables, and Jenny runs her own pottery business. She makes uh, mugs and planters and other items like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so you are the expert when it comes to growing food, and uh, a lot of us think that we are, you know, experts with our gardens or whatever, but uh, you are actually an expert in growing food, and so how, how I guess, how has this pandemic affected uh, you guys and in your life right now, how are you guys coping with it? Well, having two young children, it's a big adjustment for us in our day-to-day lives, just trying to get work done. Um, we had been sending kids to daycare before, and obviously that's not an option for us anymore. Uh, so the amount of work that we're able to do has gone down significantly. Uh, the kids, especially Asley, miss their friends, being able to get out and go and play. We're at least fortunate that we live in, in, in the countryside. We have a fair amount of open property around us that we're able to go for walks and enjoy nature without having to go and see anyone or go anywhere, really. Jenny has typically sold the majority of her pottery on, uh, in person at craft shows. All those craft shows are now canceled, so her business is looking very different. She's currently working on getting her business online and doing more online work. And for the horticulture sector in general and food production, things are obviously very different. Um, For horticulture, work is very labor intensive. A lot of labor is brought in from other countries. There's a lot of issues trying to get that labor in right now. A lot of growers are concerned that they won't be able to have enough help to be able to plant, care for, and harvest their crops. Unfortunately, the government is doing a lot to try and address those needs, make sure that we have the food security that we need. And farmers also tend to be a very resourceful group, so I am confident that solutions will be found. The pandemic has also significantly increased the demand for local foods, so anyone that produces food locally has seen a significant increase in demand. Um, So this season is probably going to be one to remember for a very long time. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, things that a lot of us don't think about, right? And, and uh, 
and you're on the front lines of that. And so thank you for, for what you're doing. And, uh, and I love your wife's, your wife's pottery. And I mentioned that uh, in our Q&A last week. And uh, usually see me holding one of her mugs every Sunday morning uh, when we could gather uh, having my coffee in it. So that's awesome. Okay, so what, what are some practical tips that you can give like a guy like me has no idea what he's doing. I like to eat food. And so uh, probably should probably try my hand at growing some. But what are some practical things that you can, uh, you can give us uh, maybe during this pandemic and, and uh, leveraging what God gave us? For sure. So the great thing with gardening is that it doesn't have to be a full-time job. It can be a hobby. And during this time, a lot of people have a lot more time at home that they're able to try new hobbies and try new things. Picking up gardening can be a great hobby for that to pass the time. And it's also extremely satisfying to actually see your food grow and be able to put it on your plate. It's also not limited to just growing fruits and vegetables. You can also do a lot of flowers and other items in the garden. And it can also just be absolutely beautiful and uh, therapeutic as well. You don't need a lot of space for a garden or even any ground space really. So even if you don't have a yard or a garden that you can plant into, you can still grow in pots. The pots can be kept outside on the lawn, the patio, balcony, anywhere that you have any space. If you are growing in pots, it's important to use a potting mix rather than soil that you would get from your yard or from a nearby field. Uh, you also need to provide fertilizer for your plants. Uh, it's, a lot of people forget this, but it's important to make sure that you're feeding your plants so they can continue to grow well and healthy. It's usually done about once per week. You should be able to pick up a fertilizer and potting mix, pots, pretty well everything at a lot of garden centers. Uh, most hardware stores will have pretty well everything you need to get started for growing, either in pots or in the soil. So whenever you're growing vegetables in pots, it's best to pick a vegetable that can be planted and harvested quickly to get multiple rounds of harvest in one planter or plant something that harvests for a very long period of time. Lettuce is a nice example of a plant that grows fairly quickly and that you can harvest fairly quickly. Another bonus with lettuce is you don't have to take the whole plant out in order to harvest it. You can take one or two leaves off at a time or however much you want and leave the rest of the plant to continue to grow up and have a continued harvest for an extended period of time before you replace the plant with a new one. Tomatoes are an absolutely great vegetable for growing in pots. Um, they grow tall, they don't take a lot of space, and they harvest for a very long period of time. The easiest way to grow tomatoes is if you actually get a plant started from a garden center rather than having to start it yourself. It also helps you get an earlier harvest instead of waiting for the whole season through. Uh, another option is herbs. Um, they don't provide a lot of food, but they do grow all summer, provide with, so you'll get fresh herbs all summer long that you can use to spice up your cooking. You can even dry or freeze them whenever the frost comes at the end of the season so that you can enjoy them through the winter as well. Um, and for going out and enjoying creation uh, as, or just for the environmental side, if you have extra time right now, you can get out, clean up some of God's creation as well. Uh, one example is driving through the countryside. You'll see a lot of ditches have garbage in them that you can see now because the snow is gone and the grass hasn't grown up to hide it yet. It's a great way to get out and get some exercise and also to show continued love and support for your community in this time whenever you can't be anywhere physically near them. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I mean, uh, my gardening technique basically is uh, after Halloween, I, uh, I take our jack-o'-lanterns and I throw them in the back 40. And then uh, the next year, I can't grow anything in my garden, but I look over where I put that pumpkin and I'm, I'm growing pumpkins, but I actually didn't mean to grow them. And so that's kind of my gardening tips. Uh, they're not really tips. They're just, uh, it's, it's just what happens. So I guess like leveraging, yeah, leveraging God's creation. So, so you probably more than the average person can see, um, you know, the, the designer creator God and um, and how we leverage what he's given us for essentials. Like, what, do you think we can learn any spiritual truths from that or, or like leveraging it for his glory? Like, what, what do you think about that? You have a great point that the creation is beautiful and it is, a, it is a great sign of what the creator has done for us, everything that's out there, to be able to just go out and enjoy the time, um, just go out and on a relaxing time, enjoy the flowers, smell the fresh air, enjoy the birds and the bees going about in their business, listen to the birds sing. Um, 
and also just take the time to be a steward of what you have so that other people can enjoy the creation as well. Um, flowers can be great as well. Like if you want to be growing some flowers, you can use that as a way to spread beauty around the world. Um, so you, if you have your flowers growing outside, people that are walking by can enjoy it, bring a smile to their faces. You can harvest the flowers, put them in vases to either enjoy for yourself inside or give them to some friends and neighbors in the area that could use a smile on their face as well. If you are growing a garden, you have any extra food, you can share that with others, um, share the abundance so that everyone will have food for their needs. That's good. That's good. Well, I appreciate your time and uh, the insights that you could give us and that's uh, super practical, super, super helpful for me and, uh, and something that, I, that I'm going to look more, more into uh, as the summer goes. Thanks so much, Brian. No problem. Thank you for having me. All right. So good, right? The, the, so we find out that, that the earth is God's, right? The, the earth is his. Everything in it is his. We learn those four truths from, from the book of Genesis. And we heard what Brian had to say. And this is kind of what he does for a living, right? He, he takes those four truths and he, he uses them and he leverages that. And, and, uh, and he, he allows those to guide him. And there's a lot of things we can learn spiritually from the environment and those four key things that God tells us. But if we go out of the book of Genesis, we also find some real interesting tidbits that God has to say about creation. The first one is this, is he asks us to care for it. Now there's three scripture passages I want to point your attention to that are really interesting when it, when it talks about caring, when God tells us to care for his creation. The first one is a story found in Exodus 26. And uh, this is real neat because God rebukes his people for, for basically abusing the land. So, so what they want to do is they want to, they want to farm that land and then they want to farm it again. They want to farm it, farm it, farm it, and they don't give the land a break. They don't give it a rest. And you see, God's creation, it has, it has ebbs and flows, it has pendulums, it has seasons, it has, it has times for work and times for rest. That's the way the weekly calendar is set up. And it's the same, it's the same with his creation, right? We find seasons. And in, in Exodus 26, they are not following that. They are abusing the land. They don't want to work it appropriately. And God tells them, no, 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 you need to rest the land. You can't abuse it. You need to take a break and, and, and stop <laughs> having soil abuse. You need to give it rest so that it's ready to go in a different year, right? All right, the second thing we see outside the book of Genesis that, uh, that God kind of instructs uh, for us to, to, to leverage is to witness with it, all right? So to witness with this thing and, uh, and, and the, what he's given us, the earth and everything in it. And I'm going to point your attention, just pushing it a little bit further to the book of Romans chapter 1, drawing your attention to 18 to 20. It reads like this, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the, un, uh, all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Now, if you're following along with me, the, the power and the beauty of God's creation, the, the things that we witness, the, the things that we see as we go for a walk or we're driving in a car or whatever it is, what we see is a witness. But it's a witness to who? See, it's a witness to those people who don't believe in God, who don't want to believe in God, who maybe are against God. It's, it's a witness really to unbelievers or even atheists. In fact, what this is saying is it's saying that any logical, honest person who, 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 who sees the creative elements, who, who witnesses the creation of God, has to conclude that there was an intelligent, powerful designer creator behind everything that we see. You have to do that, right? Because you would be lying to yourself if you did not say that there's a powerful creator, that there's a designer, that, 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 that a being created everything that we see. See, creation itself is apologetic. It, it argues that there is a God, and that there is a creator of the universe and a creator of the earth. It's a powerful witness. 
See, how, how many of you could think about a time in your life where you had a monumental experience, maybe just a jaw-dropping experience? I, I see the photos that some of you post on Instagram or, or, uh, or on Facebook, and, and you post pictures of maybe when you see a rainbow, right? or a double rainbow, and you're like, oh my goodness, I cannot believe that I saw that. Or you're at the end of a dock on a lake or on, at the, in the ocean, and you look at the heavens at nighttime, and you see all the stars in the sky, and you just look up in wonder, and you're, you're just amazed by what you see. Or you're at the top of a mountain or a peak, or, or you're in the middle of a forest, or, or, or you're canoeing on, on a lake, or, or whatever it is, and it's jaw-dropping, it's awe-inspiring, it's the leaves that are changing in the fall, it's the, the fresh blanket of snow on the trees and on the ground, it's, it's the beauty of his creation, and in those moments, it's a moving experience. I've had many of those in my life. A couple of times, I had the opportunity to go to Yosemite National Park. And uh, this is one of my favorite spots that I've ever been in my life. And I've gone there once with my brother and my dad, and, and then another time uh, with Emily and, and Brayson. And uh, just, just an absolutely amazing, amazing spot where you come to, the, to kind of the end of this road, and you, you kind of open, you, you park your car, and you walk up, and you begin to see the opening of the Yosemite Valley, and you see El Capitan. And you're, just, you're just blown away. You can't even, you can't even talk. You're just like, oh my goodness, this is absolutely incredible. It's absolutely amazing to see this and, and how God works and how he creates. Listen, if, if you are watching this, would you just, if you're on Facebook, you can you want, just post a picture that maybe you had an experience like this. Just an amazing picture of God's creation on Facebook, or, or maybe if you're watching on YouTube, you can comment about that experience, or, or how you experience God in nature. I think it's just real, real cool that, that God's creation is a witness in and of itself, right? Those of us who believe in God, we know, we know these moving experiences are, are God-led. And even people who aren't Christians, when they have moments that they see the grandeur of God's creation, are moved. It's awe-inspiring, right? I've never really heard of someone having a similar experience that I had as I looked out to El Capitan uh, at the dump on the 416 on the way into Barhaven. I've never had someone have kind of one of those experiences when, uh, when they're at the waste transfer facility uh, kind of dropping off their garbage. Or when they're picking, the, the garbage truck is picking up the garbage. To we don't have those experiences when we see pollution like that, but we do when we see God's creation and how it was intended to be seen, Right? Some of our best communicators, some of the best poets and musicians, they get, their, they get their, their inspiration in God's creation as they go for a walk or as they're sailing on a boat or as they're flying over the clouds and witnessing how good God actually is. You see, see where I'm getting with this? Where I'm getting at is that creation itself does powerful things to people, to humanity when we see what God did and how he did it. See, I've only been to the Holy Land once. And uh, while I was there, we spent some time around the Sea of Galilee. And uh, the Sea of Galilee is not a huge body of water, about 130 kilometers square. And, uh, and, and, and all around it are hills and some mountains. And, and I was on a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And we were over kind of in Tiberias and, and up on the Mount of Beatitudes, kind of looking down over it. And it's kind of some of the places where Jesus would have walked because Jesus spent a lot of his ministry around the Sea of Galilee. And what's interesting is that many times he would go off and, and be in God's creation and talk to his father and spend time by himself in the midst of God's handiwork and get close to his heavenly Father. See, God's creative realm, it has intrinsic value, but it also adds value to our lives in unexpected ways. It sets the context for defining moments. It calms our spirits. It, it stimulates creativity. It, it increases our faith. And really, it shows us as a map of our spiritual walk 
and how we grow closer to God as we learn the truths of gardening and managing God's creation, right? And so I got some challenges for you, and, uh, and I threw them up here, uh, the next steps for this teaching. And, and here's what I want you to do. I, I, wanna, I want you to understand why God values his creation and the environment and nature. And, and I want you to understand that. So let's ask ourselves the question that has to be asked. Are we, in fact, doing well with this? I mean, just as a believer, in understanding that all of creation is actually a witness to God, how are you doing with that? If you were going to give yourself a grade when it comes to creation care, are, are you giving yourself an A, a B, a C, a D, an F? Like, what, what are you giving yourself when it comes to creation care? Just be honest. Just self-evaluate, all right? The, the next thing I wrote down is this. Take an opportunity during this pandemic, all right? Take an opportunity to go out in God's creation. I mean, wherever it's allowed, I don't know, I don't know near you where, where you're allowed to do that necessarily, but go out and uh, experience God's creation. Go for a walk at nighttime and look at the stars, all right? Lay out in your backyard and, and check out. There's no planes flying, right? Just go out and, and witness the beauty of God's creation. That, that's my challenge for you and, uh, and understand it in a special way. And then finally, number three, learn some spiritual truths through, through gardening and working the land. If, if you have kids, Teach them God's truth by gardening with them. Teach them the care of God's creation and, and going back to the book of Genesis by, by mowing the lawn and trimming the trees and, and experiencing what God, how God's provided as you go for a walk through the woods. And, and you can talk about God and the creation of the world and how much he loves us. Spend some time. Teach your kids about that. Learn about it yourself and increase your faith and understanding of your walk with God. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, uh, I just thank you for your creation and I thank you for how good you are and how much you love us, that you've designed this world in such an amazing, unique, and special way, Father. You, 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 you've made us in your image and we know that we are set apart, that we are different as, as human beings uh, over the rest of, of creation and all the things that you've made and, and animals and, and, and the oceans and the skies, and, and, but we have a we have a responsibility. We are entrusted with this to leverage it for your glory and your honor, God. And so teach us through it and help us to grow closer to you as we understand it better. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, my days I've been held in you.
Now you saw my plant at the beginning of this, so I that was so good. I have some things I can put into practice this week. And be sure to turn on your notifications so you can stay connected with us and join our community. See you next week.